Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's session of our The Professor Speaks lecture series. I am Curtis Busby Earl, and at the moment, I am the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Science and Technology here on the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, the Professor Speaks lecture series affords members of our academic community, uh, those who are at the level of professor, uh, to share with us their thoughts on matters of national, regional, international importance, and or their past or ongoing research endeavors. And it is with great pleasure that today we have with us Professor Marcia Roy. Certainly, Professor Roy is a well-respected academic here in our community and internationally, and also certainly within the faculty itself, she is well known for her warmth and her humility. And we are very, very pleased to have her here with us today. Also with us today, and who will likely tell you a lot more about Professor Roy, is another giant in the academic community here at uh, the university and in the region and certainly here in Jamaica. And that lady is Professor Emerita Denise Eldemeyer Shero. There are so many things I could also say about Professor Shero, but I would like to provide you with two quotes uh, as my introduction to Professor Eldemeyer Shero, who would then tell us a bit more about Professor Marcia Roy, who, as I said, is the lady of the hour today. Uh, and here's a quote. If effervescence was a person, it would be the beautiful Eldermeyer girl who married Yushara and has been championing causes for senior citizens in Jamaica. Professor Eldermeyer Shera is a medical doctor and the island's resident aging expert who has spent decades engaging, researching, listening, working, and developing policy on behalf of Jamaica's over 60 years cohort. And so it is also with great pleasure that I now invite Professor Emerita Denise Eldemeyer Shero to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Marcia Roy. Professor Eldemeyer Shero. Thank you so much, Curtis. It, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure who's on, um, so I'm not sure who I should recognize. So good afternoon all. Today's a uh, very important day for Professor Roy, an important day also for all of us that have known her and that have tracked her to see her come to this point. But where did it all start? It all started in St. Elizabeth. And if you have met her parents or her mother certainly and the family around her, the sisters, the aunts, you would well understand why Curtis talks about her humility. She comes from that background, um, humility mixed with pride, because as she likes to describe herself, this little, look what this little girl from St. Elizabeth Bush has come to. It's a journey that embodies two main, I think there's two parts to her, two, two parts to Marcia. There is research of which she's passionate and I will speak, but there's also her total UWI commitment. She started her degrees at UWI with her BSc in 1992. I noticed that yesterday when FST was having their open day, their orientation, she proudly announced that her son was in the group. And this is not her first one, it's her second son. She got a PhD four, day, four years later in 1996 and became a research assistant right away. So Professor Roy has been UWI from the day she walked through that door in the late 80s until today as we speak. It's a tremendous journey and it should be a motivating journey to all of our young people on, on this call and who are listening to her. By 2017, she was professor and she's now director of grad studies. But Professor Roy is rooted in research. 
I remember her speaking at a graduate students award ceremony and talking about that journey in 1990. It would have been 92 to 96, part of which took her abroad. She managed during all of that to marry, to have children and to complete her research while pregnant. So that shows you the commitment to research. It's therefore not surprising that she has 35 publications and four book chapters. I got to know Marcia, now she becomes Marcia. I got to know her really well when we started working together some 14, 15 years ago through Grad Studies Committee, I was still in FMS. And she, she would drive all of us crazy as she, as she argued passionately for the research grants, et cetera, for, for FST. I would say to her, Marcia, you've already got 75% of the money. Can somebody else get it? No, there was a student who needed to do their research. Don't you know that reagents are expensive? It is therefore not surprising that she took this journey from the faculty deputy dean through to the campus and eventually to the unit, to the to Mona and to represent all grad students. So it is this passion that she brings to her work. She's a motivator in anybody listening to her history would recognize that UWI has opportunities for all. You just need to be a hard worker. She still is doing her research even while director of grad studies and still has papers submitted with her students for publication. I can think of no person more fitting than Professor Roy to be the professor that speaks. Over to you, Professor Roy. Thank you very much, Denise. I really appreciate those words. You have been an academic mother to me all this time. But let's get into the research. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my evolution and virus evolution. Two groups of viruses that I studied, gemniviruses and HIV. They are very different. As Denise said, I am a professor of molecular virology and the director for graduate studies and research. So back in the early 90s when Wayne McLaughlin and I set out and we started this research project, what we knew was that there was been golden yellow mosaic virus infecting red peas in Jamaica. And you see the yellow mosaic symptoms on the plant. So we we'll set out to look at the distribution of this virus on the island and we went sampling. Now, when you go sampling, you also include the little young scientists in the area. So my children would come with me and my nieces and nephew, they would help me find plant samples. Auntie Marcia, look at this one. Auntie Marcia tests that plant and they're still doing it today, 20 years later. So this is what we found. These plants all having symptoms and we get excited when we see this, although it's not a good thing that the plant is infected with a virus. So this is tomato plant and the leaves are supposed to be flat and green and you notice that the ed edges are curled up. This is the scotch bonnet pepper again with the crumpling of the leaves and the leaves curling up. And you see the dry farming in St. Elizabeth and the intercropping with the scallion. We also notice symptoms on the cabbage. You notice that there's no cabbage head being formed. This is the gungo peas or the red peas also with yellow mosaic symptoms. And always in the background, you see the weeds. A papaya plant, which is on the right, and it has leaf curling symptoms. The leaves curling down and the margin of the leaves are yellow. The, the healthy plant is also there, and this is pumpkin. So we get excited because that means there's work to be done. The bogan villa, which is an ornamental plant, has mottling symptoms. This is the hibiscus with vein clearing symptoms and another ornamental called ba Balencia repent. Then these are the weeds with yellow mosaic symptoms, malacra, a butylon americanum, we get excited. This is a legume called Rincosia minima. And remember, 
the leaves are supposed to be green. You will see the green leaves in the background, but when they get this yellow mosaic, it suggests that there might be a virus infecting the plant. Cider, also with yellow mosaic symptoms, many different weeds. This is Macroptilium lateroides again, and this is Wysodula amplissima. So we go sampling, these are the plants that we find. So many people believe that if you give the plant enough water and light, then it will grow. So down in St. Elizabeth, I'm known as the plant doctor. My mom calls me the plant doctor. So if you give the plant enough light, water and fertilizer, many believe that it will grow and be productive, but this is not true if the plant is infected with a virus and there are no medicine for plant viruses. Once the plant is infected, maybe the best thing to do is to destroy the plant so it doesn't act as a host so that other viruses, so other virus can be transmitted from it. So we set out to look at these gemniviruses that were infecting crops and weeds in Jamaica, and then we found them later in the ornamentals. And the idea is to identify what they are and then to implement control strategies for these viruses so we can increase productivity. So what are gemniviruses? Since their discovery in the, 90, in the late 70s, more than 500 gemniviruses have been identified globally. They have a circular DNA genome, unlike the COVID virus or the HIV that has an RNA genome. This is what the genome looks like. Remember, it's a circle and the color indicates the different genes. It can have one component, which is about 2,700 nucleotides, or two components, which is about 5,000 nucleotides, and that's important, and you're going to learn why. They are transmitted by insects called whitefly, and the whiteflies, although they are large here, they're really about one or two millimeter long, and they transmit the virus from the infected plant to the healthy plant. These gemniviruses have wiped out entire crop globally, including tomato, beans, corn, cassava, and cotton, and these are very important crops globally. Now I want to bring your attention to two different types of white flies so you don't get confused. My white fly that transmit gemniviruses, that's one word, Bemisia tabacai. You might be familiar with the other white fly, which is two words, which is a powdery substance at the underside of the leaf. My white fly does not have that powdery substance, you see it all over the white fly floating around in the morning. So the one, the white fly, which is small without the powdery substance, that's the one we talk about. So once we collect those plants with all my little virus hunters, we take them back to the lab, we extract the DNA, and we spot them on a membrane and use a gemnivirus probe to detect if any of the plants have viruses. And you will see the purple spots here. On this membrane, we have DNA from 70 plants and 52 is suggesting by the purple spot that they might have virus. So that means we get excited and we have work to do. Once we get the hybridization signals, then we amplify part of the genome using PCR, the same PCR they're talking about for the COVID. So we amplify part of the genome using specific primers for gemniviruses and the yellow arrays indicating the PCR product. So that's another confirmatory test that our plant is infected with a gemnivirus, but we don't know what it is yet. Remember that the gemniviruses, some have two components. So once you get a DNA A, then you use the PCR to detect for the DNA B. So this is the PCR for the DNA B. We amplify a little region, about five, 500 nucleotides. And here the purple arrows are indicating the PCR products around the same size. And they might be the same virus, but they could be different. But when you get PCR products indicated by the yellow and red arrow, which are different sizes, then we know that those are different viruses. So on this gel, we might have four different viruses. Over 30 years of research, we've identified 24 different gemniviruses in crops, weeds, and ornamentals in Jamaica. 17 are novel, which means that our research group was the first group to identify these viruses. And those are, the novel ones are indicated by an N. 
So the first virus we told you about was in Jamaica, the bean gold and yellow mosaic virus. In the cabbage, we found two viruses, cabbage leaf curl virus and cabbage leaf curl Jamaica virus. When you identify a virus for the first time, you get to decide a creative name. So in this case, we included Jamaica for that unique virus. In the tomato, and pepper, there were two viruses, tomato dwarf leaf curl virus, also new, and tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Tomato yellow leaf curl virus was not new, but we know it's a devastating virus. Both these viruses also occur in the scotch bonnet pepper and can occur in mixed infection. In the weeds, we found viruses in Euphorbia heterophylla, in Jatropha, we found three viruses in the Macroptilium. All three viruses were unique. In the Malvastrum americanum, we found two viruses. Malvastrum yellow mosaic helsha virus, which means it was first identified in helsha, and Malvastrum yellow mosaic Jamaica virus. So we get very creative with the names. This is a weed called Rincosia minima, and it's very interesting because it's a weed in Jamaica and the virus that is in this weed called Rincosia minima, golden mosaic, Yucatan virus also infects gungo peas or what some might call um, pigeon peas. It, and this virus has also been identified in Mexico. So it's not new, but it's the first time it is being shown to infect gungo peas. Then a second virus, which is also in this weed infects tobacco in Cuba, tobacco yellow crinkle virus. So it's infecting a weed in Jamaica, but tobacco in Cuba. This is cider and we did uh, virus sequencing from many cider species and we identified five different viruses in cider. Four were unique and one was a similar virus, cider yellow, yellow vein virus from Mexico. So we got creative with the names again, cider golden mosaic, Jamaica virus, cider golden mosaic, BRCA virus from BRCA in Trelawney, cider golden mosaic, Buckup virus, the picture of the, the little virus hunters that I showed you, that's from Buckup in Manchester and cider golden mosaic, Ligony virus. This weed called Malacra also infected with a virus that's infecting tobacco in Cuba, tobacco leaf curl, Cuba virus. And then Wysadula amplicema infected with two distinct viruses. Then there are others that we're still working on. Our sequence data suggests that the papaya is infected with a novel virus. The Bougainville is infected with Macroptilium yellow mosaic virus. Borhavia species is infected with a novel virus, and we are still continuing to decipher the virus that's in Centrosema, Costalexia. Macroptilium atroperporeum is infected with the same virus that's in Bougainvillea. Bastardia, we are characteriz characterizing that virus similar to Jatropha multifida. Synodrella and Hibiscus, we are still working on that one and Valencia repent. So there's a little bit more work to do. So if there are any virus hunters out there who want to join us, then we welcome you. So what we have found is that the bean golden yellow mosaic virus that's infecting red peas and broad bean, which is an important source of protein for resource limited individuals, most of the most of the um, red peas that's in your sunder rice and peas or in your stew peas is probably imported because this virus is very severe. So we cannot produce um, red peas and broad bean very economically because of this disease. In the tomato, there's tomato yellow leaf curl virus. In St. Elizabeth, we call it the jerry curl disease. And if you look at the picture, you can see the little white flies that transmit the virus. This Jericho virus is the most destructive virus infecting tomatoes globally. And remember, it's also affecting our scotch bonnet pepper. And there's a second virus that's in the tomato and they can also occur in mixed infection. So working with Bodles Agricultural Station, 
we have been able to identify varieties of tomato, gem star, gem pear, and gem pride, and adonis that are tolerant to the virus. That means that they don't get infected or get very severe symptoms. You might get 75, 80% of your productivity. So through RADA, we advise the farmers to plant these varieties of tomato. Unfortunately, we have not found any varieties of pepper that are resistant, but I know Bodil's Agricultural Research Station continue to work to identify varieties of pepper that is resistant to these two viruses. I don't think anything can replace our scotch bonnet pepper, so that continues to be a problem. Remember, in the cabbage, we found two viruses, cabbage leaf curl virus and cabbage leaf curl Jamaica virus. Cabbage leaf curl virus also occurs in the United States, in Florida and in Georgia. And if you look at the picture, I am from the area of Jamaica in St. Elizabeth, where we have the rich red bauxite soil that is being shown here. So our work has shown that the Tropicana variety of cabbage will resist the virus so we also through RADA advise the farmers to plant this variety so we've had some success now something interesting happened with the cabbage virus so imagine with me that the cabbage leaf curl virus the one in jamaica and florida remember the genome is circular but imagine that the genome is blue and then there's a weed called Macroptilium that has a virus called Macroptilium golden mosaic virus, and that genome is green. The cabbage leaf curl Jamaica virus, part of the genome is identical to the virus in the Macroptilium, and part of it is identical, the blue part to the virus, cabbage leaf curl virus. So this is a new virus that is unique to Jamaica. This is virus evolution in real time. This virus, can in the cabbage leaf curl Jamaica virus can infect cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli, and it has only been identified in Jamaica. In the weeds, there are many viruses. These viruses are distinct from the ones in the crop, but in the lab, the euphorbia mosaic virus, we have been able to infect tomatoes, peppers, and beans, but this does not occur in the field only on the lab conditions. So we continue to watch this virus because what it means is that the u 4 mosaic virus might evolve and continue to change and be able to infect these crops, but we hope that that doesn't happen. Similarly for the virus in the Macroptilium, around about 2017, we found that this virus was associated with a satellite, which is another small part of the DNA. And this virus, is infecting bougainvillea and two macroptilium species and research has shown that the satellite that's there with the virus might increase the host range and allow it to infect other crops that it would not normally do and it's this macroptilium yellow mosaic virus is able to infect scotch bonnet pepper and red peas but this does not happen in the field so right now the viruses that are infecting the crops the viruses that are infecting the weeds in Jamaica have not been found in any crop. Now, once we have the virus sequence, one question that we want to ask, where are they coming from? So we compare the viruses from Jamaica to the other Gemini viruses from all over the world to see if we can get some insight into where are these viruses coming from? And you can see the red star. This is a phylogenetic tree and the red star represents some of the viruses from Jamaica. And if they were all coming from the same ancestral virus, they would group together, but you see they are dispersed in the tree. So we're still not sure where they are coming from most of the viruses. So we have two side of virus that's very similar to one in Mexico. The Malvastrum virus, those are most closely related to each other. And there's a virus in Waisadula that's similar to a virus in Cuba. So the question that we ask, where are they coming from? And the only answer that we have is that the viruses in the region generally are circulating. So we know that being golden mosaic virus is in Latin America, in Dominican Republic, in Brazil, in Argentina. So it's circulating in the Caribbean. The TYLCV, the Jerry Curl virus, we suspect was imported into Jamaica in tomato seedlings in the late 80s when they were trying a project called Spring Plains to grow 
vegetable for the winter market, but we are not sure, but we suspect that's when that virus came in. The cabbage leaf curl virus in Jamaica and Florida, we don't know where, if it started here or in Florida, we are not sure. Two viruses in Rincosha and in Saida are similar, are identical in Jamaica and Mexico, but we are not really sure who, which country it moved from. Then we have two viruses that's infecting crop crops in Cuba, tobacco crop in Cuba and weeds in Jamaica. So the viruses are circulating. Another theory is that we have the white fly that transmit the virus. So there was a biotype of white fly or a strain of white fly here called the A biotype, and it wasn't able to transmit the virus very well. And that was replaced by another biotype of white fly called the B biotype that has a large host range and is able to transmit the virus. And so that might explain the movement and the large distribution of these viruses. For the cabbage leaf curl Jamaica virus, we know we've seen evidence, clear evidence of recombination, but remember 17 of the 24 viruses are unique to Jamaica. So we're still not sure where these viruses are coming from. But I consider it a blessing because I could have studied any group of viruses, but somehow, you know, Wayne plucked me out and asked me to help him with gemnivirus research. And 30 years later, we have 17 new viruses. So I consider it a blessing. I've also done some work on HIV along with the University Hospital of the West Indies and the Ministry of Health and the Institute for Human Virology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. So what we were looking at is HIV drug resistance. So what we set out to do is to sequence two HIV genes, the reverse transcriptase and the protease gene. The reverse transcriptase causes the virus to replicate and the protease is an important gene for the virus to be able to function. And what we wanted to do was to identify mutations or changes in the genome of the virus that can lead to drug resistance. So the genome of this virus is about 10,000 nucleotides and it's an RNA virus. Remember the gemnivirus is a DNA virus and it produces 15 proteins unlike the gemniviruses that produce about six. So it's much more complicated and a larger genome. And we want to sequence just 1,200 nucleotides of the 10,000 and try to identify drug resistance. So what is this drug resistance? HIV that can replicate in the presence of the drug if the patient is taking the drug and the virus continues to replicate and devastate the immune system, then that virus is resistant to the drug. Now, if you're not on any HIV treatment and the virus is able to replicate because your immune system is not able to control it, then you can produce millions of viral particles each day. Each time the virus replicates, it produces one mutation. That is a change in one nucleotide of the 10,000 nucleotides of the genome. And this happens randomly. Now, if this mutated strain becomes resistant and the drug cannot destroy it, then that becomes a problem. So let's look at your taking the drug, the HIV drug, and the, there are many different viral strains. So we represent them here in color in green and orange and purple. So the drug is able to prevent the replication of the green and the orange. So those will eventually be removed from the body. But the purple one the, is resistant to the drug. So the drug is not able to destroy that one. So it will continue to replicate and cause the disease. So what we set out to do is to sequence these 1200 nucleotides in the genome that represents these two genes to identify mutations associated with the drugs that are being used, to identify the ineffective drugs, replace the ineffective drugs with more effective drugs and to improve HIV treatment and of course, improve the quality of life for HIV patients. How do we do this? The physician would collect the blood sample and we would take it to the lab and extract the viral genome. Remember, it's an RNA virus similar to the COVID. Then we would synthesize DNA from the RNA. 
doing two rounds of PCR, doing it twice. So we have enough PCR products so we can sequence, very similar to what we do for the gemniviruses. Once we have the sequence, we do it, we sequence the genome from each individual, each patient three times, because remember, this is 1200 nucleotides and just one nucleotide can cause that virus to become resistant. So we combine those three sequences to produce a consensus sequence. And that's the sequence that we're going to use to look for the mutations. Now, sequence analysis can be very tricky. And because we're looking for single nucleotide change, then we have to make sure the sequence is accurate. So here on this slide, you see a N, N mean that it can be any nucleotides, A, T, C, and G, but we cannot use a sequence that has N. So here you see two overlapping peaks, a blue peak overlapping a green peak, and the computer is not able to decipher it. So sometimes you have to look at it manually. And the blue represents a C and the green represents an A. So that N becomes an A. So we get the correct sequence, remove all the Ns, and we send the sequence over the internet to Stanford University that has the HIV drug resistance database. The database will send back to us a drug resistant profile that looks like this, very busy, but the first arrow is indicating mutations or changes in the HIV genome. And the red box is indicating that once you have those changes in the genome, the drug will not be able to destroy the HIV. So the, there is drug resistance to these six drugs that are in the box. Then if you have this second change indicated by the arrow, this mutation will cause resistance to three different drugs on this list. So this patient is susceptible to one drug and have intermediate resistance to another. So that reduces the type of drug that can be successfully used to treat the HIV patient. There are other my apology, there are other mutations that don't cause drug resistance, but you want to keep your eye on them because they can develop into mutations that can cause drug resistance. So in one study that we did with adults, we were able to identify that the subtype or strain of HIV that's circulating in Jamaica is the B subtype. And that's similar to what's in the United States and in Europe and the rest of the Caribbean. And HIV have many strains and they named them according to the letters of the alphabet, similar to what's going on with COVID currently. So for the 122 adults, we got results for 92. And of those 92 patients, 26 of the patients had drug resistant mutations. And it was the first time we were using DNA sequencing to identify drug mutations in the patients. So the physician would get the drug resistant profile and evaluate it and decide what are the best drugs to use to treat that patient. We did similar research with the children. So we had 45 children in our study and we got results for 41. And of the 41 children, 39 of those children had drug resistant mutations. Now, four of the children had resistance to a drug to drug in the class called protease inhibitors, which was very concerning because that's kind of the last resort drug when most of the other drugs don't work. So this is a case study of a nine-year-old girl from the University Hospital of the West Indies. We don't know who the patients are. They have an ID number under the physician knows who the patients are. This Nine-year-old has 15 different mutations that can cause resistance in several drugs. So we circle the mutations in the red circle and we draw a line through the drug, which means that the patient is resistant to the drug. More mutations, more drug resistance, other mutations, more drug resistance, other mutation, more drug resistance. So of the, of the 10 drugs that we use in the public health sector to treat HIV at the time when we were doing this study, this nine-year-old girl was resistant to seven of those 10 drugs, which limits the um, choice of drugs that the physician can use to treat the HIV that's infecting the little girl. So we know that 
antiretroviral drug resistance and transmission of these resistant HIV strain is a concern in our Jamaican population. And it, we suggested that regular HIV drug resistance profile can improve treatment because we can eliminate the drugs that the patient is likely to be resistant to because of the mutations and use the drugs that will be used to successfully treat the patient. The test at the time was a 200 US dollar test, so we know that cost would be a factor in our resource limited environment. But we were the first group to see to have several full length sequence of HIV in the database. And we also have sequences for the adults and children that we did um, sequencing for. So I've also dabbled in a few other things with my colleagues. So Professor Paula Tennant and I were using small RNA sequencing to look at viruses in hot pepper, sweet pepper and sweet potato. And the beauty about this is we don't need to have any information about the virus that's in the plant. We're going to sequence everything that's in the plant and we discard the plant sequences or the non-virus sequence. And when we did this for the scotch bonnet pepper, we found six different viruses infecting the scotch bonnet pepper plants. We found two viruses in the tomato, including the jerry curl virus and two viruses in the sweet pepper and four of the viruses were being reported for the first time. The viruses were not unique viruses, but they were being reported in Jamaica for the first time. And we also identified viruses in sweet potato. With Professor Mona Weber, and Mona taught me something very important. You know, she asked me to do this project with the Queen Conk. Remember I was working on plant viruses and she asked me to help her with this project. And it was the first time I was stepping out of my comfort zone, but it worked out very well. We had two very interesting PhD students and they went to the Smithsonian Institute in Florida, Kimani and Azra, along with our collaborator, Nathan Trulove. And for the first time, we were looking at genetic studies in Queen Conch in Jamaica. This is the conch that's in your conch soup. And Jamaica have the largest reserve of Queen Conch in the world because in most other places it has been fished to ex extinction. So it's very important that we protect the population. So when we started this study, only one Queen Conch sequence was in the GenBank database and we were able to add sequences to the sequence that were in the J database. We had two peer review publications and the information that we got about the genetics of the conch in the Caribbean and in Jamaica is helping to strengthen conch fishery management strategy in the region because, because the, the conch are on the endangered list then at sometimes we have to have a closed season to allow them to recover. So one thing it taught us that we, we uh, look at two different methods using microchondrial DNA or microsatellites to evaluate what is the best method to um, study the queen conch. And we were able to do that with the help of the Smithsonian Institute in Florida. So what everybody must appreciate is all of this research is powered by collaborators and scientists all over the world here at UWI, at the University Hospital in the United States, in the UK, Borders Agricultural Research Station, the Institute of Human Virology, Smithsonian Institute. We did some work in Peru, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Office of Graduate Studies and Research. And you will see on the right, we have a list of graduate students who have, I've had the pleasure to work with and train, and they are making their own impact in the world. And I've also trained 30 undergraduate students, many who have gone on to do um, research in their own right and impact the world. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Roy. Um, Marcia, before we, before we leave, you and I have had many conversations, Marcia Roy, about getting you on this um, series of lectures and to answer the 
question that you've always posed to me to, you know, try to avoid giving us the pleasure of listening to your work and so on, that it may not be as, as interesting. Well, I am certain all of us who have been here today can agree with me that what you have discussed today is not only extraordinarily interesting, but very important work that you've been doing over the past 20 to 30 years. Um, there are so many things that I personally would like to ask, but we'll do that at another time. I would like to therefore say thank you very much for your time today and for sharing with us all of the work that you've done on viruses, both plants, both people, and in the Queen Conk and anything else that you may decide to engage in, in terms of your research. And I'd also like to say thank you to Professor Emerita, Denise Eldemeyer Shera for her time today with us. And of course, to all of you who have taken the time today to spend with us for about an hour or so, I, I would also like to apologize for the bit of the delayed start. There were some technical difficulties, but these things happen from time to time. We can't always control everything. So ladies and gentlemen, those of you that have joined us here in Jamaica or somewhere in the Caribbean or anywhere else in the world through our YouTube channel, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to seeing you again for the next in our uh, series of the Professor Speaks. And so with that, have a pleasant afternoon. See you again soon.